Okay. In this video, we'll walk through a couple examples of applying Carnot maps with four input variables. We'll see that it is very similar to three variable maps. As a side note, it is possible to make K maps with five or six inputs, but those get rather large and tricky to see patterns. For Boolean equations with a larger set of inputs, there are more advanced algorithms available, which are usually implemented as computer code. If you are interested in this, I recommend beginning with the Espresso algorithm. For a Boolean equation with four inputs, the true table has 16 rows, like you see in this example. Correspondingly, the K-map has 16 squares, arranged in a 4x4 grid. Each row or column represents the values for two input variables, and they are arranged in gray code. A standard setup is shown here, with the input variables in alphabetic order, and the gray code going 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. We actually could alter this pattern. For example, we could swap the order of x and w, but that makes it tougher to connect to the truth table. We could also rearrange the input bit codes. For instance, we could go 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. As long as only one bit changes between each adjacent square, the KMAP strategy will hold, but we'll find our work much less error prone if we stick with the standard format. Each time we see Q equals 1 in the truth table, we can fill in a 1 to a particular square on the KMAP. The first 1 is in the top row at input code 0000. So we fill in the square. The next 1 from the truth table is at input code 0001. In this square, w and x are both 0, y is 0, and z is 1. So that is the matching square, and we fill in the output 1. We continue this pattern for the rest of the truth table. In the end, we see 8 trues in the truth table, so there are 8 trues in the k-map. Next step is to identify groups. The same rules apply as with 3-input maps. All groups must include only ones, contain adjacent squares, and be of a size that is an integer power of 2. The bigger the groups we can find, the simpler our final equation. One special consideration here is the fact that the four corner squares would form a group of four. I'll indicate that group now with these red lines. By wraparound adjacency, the top left corner is adjacent to the top right corner, and also the bottom left corner. However, the top left corner is not adjacent to the bottom right corner. Why? Because two bits change between those two squares. So if we ever see a case where it is only opposite corners filled in, they would not constitute a group of two. But when all four corners are filled in, that does make a group of four. This is because top left is adjacent to top right. Top right is adjacent to bottom right bottom right is adjacent to bottom left, and bottom left is adjacent to top left. So that is the first group we circled. What will be the next group? It is this top left quadrant. An overlap with another group is allowed. We have a single one remaining, so what group should we circle next? It is this group of two in the lower right. Remember, we want the largest groups possible, which is why I include this final true as a group of two, rather than using the smaller group of one. Now for each group, identify the associated product term. Pause the video until you get those. The four corners group in red gives us the product term x prime z prime. Within this group, W changes, so it drops out of the product term. Y also changes, so it drops out. Throughout the group, x equals 0, so x prime remains. Finally, z is always 0, so z prime remains. Following the same approach, we identify w prime y prime for the brown group and w y z prime for the purple group. 
Lastly, we OR together those three product terms and set the expression equal to Q. And there we have the final equation. Note how the smaller group led to the longer product term. This is because a smaller group means we must be more specific to define that group, which means more variables. There is some confusion regarding which group shapes are allowed on K-maps, so I put together this slide. On the left side are group shapes that are allowable. On the right side are group shapes that are not. As you know, allowable group sizes are integer powers of 2, which includes 1, 2, 4, and 8. So these shapes with sizes of 6 and 9 are not allowable. Also, we can't have a single square jutting out from the rest. The underlying reason is that a product term cannot succinctly summarize these oddly shaped groups because the square jutting out differs by too many input variables. Remember that k-maps are designed to allow groupings of similar terms. So these unique squares are not similar enough to the rest of the group. Let's look at one more four-variable example, this one defining Q using the shorthand canonical SOP notation. Each number in the sum represents a single min term, or square, on the K-map. What is the 4-bit code for decimal 1? It is 0001. The square here represents the input value 0, 0, 0, 1, and so that min term equals 1. What is the 4-bit code for decimal 5? it is 0101. And so the square here, 0101, gets filled in. Decimal 6 leads to 0110, and so on for each of the min terms in the sum. At the end, these 10 ones are filled in. Now the grouping is a little tricky. I want you to try this one out for yourself. So pause the video until you think you have identified all the groups. The first thing to avoid is making a group of 9. It is tempting because we see such a clean 3x3 three three square, but remember that only powers of 2 are allowed. The first group that I circle is this tall, skinny, brown group. I was drawn there first because of this one that juts out. The other ones in the big group have multiple groups they could be a part of, but this isolated one can only be a part of a single group of 4. So. I circle that group first. Now there are six ones remaining. The most efficient route is to have two groups of four to cover those, shown here in purple and red. The overlap is allowed. A common mistake is to see these last two ones remaining and make a group of two out of them. That would produce an equation that is logically correct, but not as efficient as possible. So let's use the bigger group of four. Those groups lead to this final equation. It is color-coded to match the groups with their product terms. So we can see, for instance, that in this tall, skinny brown group, y always is 0 and z always is 1. So the product term is y prime z. I'll leave it to you to verify the other product terms. Could we have made other groups of 4 in this example? Yes, we could have. For example, this group of 4 in the middle. But what benefit would that produce? All of those ones have already been covered by other groups, so any term coming from that group would be redundant. This is why I identified the isolated one up top to help me make the first group. That led to then making these other groups of four and never wasting my time on the redundant options. All right, you should be well equipped now to apply Carnot maps to simplify three and four variable Boolean equations in canonical SOP forms. But what about POS forms? And what about non-canonical forms? That's what the next video is about.